WCW Super Brawl 7 took place on February 23rd, 1997 from the legendary Cow Palace in San Francisco. Just under 13,500 fans packed the venue to see Roddy Piper get a shot at Hollywood Hogan's WCW Championship in the main event. Something I want to get out of the way is I love the setup for this pay per view. WCW were improving their sets greatly, and in comparison to the WWF's Final Four show the previous week, the Cow Palace in the Super Brawl entranceway looked brilliant. It's one of my favourite WCW sets. Tonight's show is absolutely jam packed. 10 matches take place at Super Brawl 7, so let's not waste any time and let's check out the event. Those who watched Reliving the War this past week would know that Roddy Piper locked himself up in Alcatraz in order to get mentally prepared for his match against Hulk Hogan. Well, at the very beginning of Super Brawl, we see Piper getting released from his cell and, you know, I could have bought the Nitro promo because it was still pretty well done, but here, the way Piper runs out of Alcatraz like some sort of savage beast who hasn't seen sunlight in 20 years, it's a bit over the top for my tastes. Piper says that he didn't lock himself up for nothing, Hogan is an endangered species and he's an extinction, and the Super Brawl intro ends with Piper screaming that he's on his way to Super Brawl while taking note of the shark infested waters that surround Alcatraz Island. Tony Schiavone, Bobby Heenan and Dusty Rhodes are going to call the action tonight and the commentators talk about all hell breaking loose when Roddy Piper arrives at the venue. Good times, good times. Our opening bout is the Cruiserweight Championship match, Dean Malenko vs Six. Malenko is the current Cruiserweight Champion but Six stole the belt. Six done the same thing to Eddie Guerrero in the US Championship back in December and I think it's a nice little gimmick he has going on here, fuck being the belt collector, be the belt thief. Six reason that he only steals belts because it leads him to getting title shots and well, if it works, it works. Sean Walton was trained by Boris Malenko, Dean's father, and this was used in the storyline. Six said all respect he had for the Malenko's died along with Boris, and so Dean walks to the ring at Super Brawl with the intent of doing some serious damage. Six takes a beating to start this one off and Dean has an opportunity to end the match early but he breaks up the pin, he wants to teach Waltman a lesson. A few forearms in the corner get followed up with a brain buster and the two men begin slapping each other while Six lays on the mat. Six continues to aggravate his opponent as the commentators talk about Malenko being unfocused here and they're right. We watch a lot of Dean Malenko matches in this series and we know how methodical the Iceman usually is, but he's trying to teach Six a lesson and that's coming at the expense of his usual moveset. It's actually great to see. Six gets a boot up in the corner but Malenko fires back with a power slam. We then see a chin lock. Six then finds himself cowering away in the corner as Dean lays in a few headbutts. Six goes for a Bronco Buster to a standing Dean Malenko but Dean dodges it. I wonder how that would have looked if Six hit his target. Waltman is hung up in the tree of woe and Malenko performs a dropkick to Six's knee. Malenko then decides to end it with a Texas Cloverleaf but a rake to the eyes keeps Waltman in the match. The match then spills to the outside and Dean decides to take his cruiserweight title and hold it up in the air, showing everyone that he's the true champion. This should have given Six an opening but Dean puts his opponent right back down before the two competitors get back in the ring. Malenko is destroying the challenger here. Finally, Six is able to get some offense in when he catches Dean with a kick. Malenko takes a kick combo in the corner and Six chokes him at the turnbuckles. We then see a Bronco Buster as Bobby Heenan talks about Malenko's history with neck problems. Six tries to pin Malenko after a drop kick but Malenko kicks out. Waltman then tries a sleeper hold twice and both times Malenko is able to escape. He escapes the second with a back suplex that folded Waltman up big time. Six makes Malenko pay with a boot to the head. Waltman then performs a diving elbow drop on Dean while Dean was draped over the apron. We then see a diving leg drop from Six, all this only leads to a two count. Another sleeper gets applied and the crowd pops when Dean eventually gets up and he applies a sleeper of his own. Six gets out and he goes for a top rope attack but Malenko counters it. Six tries to shift his body weight during a top rope backdrop but he overshoots it slightly, leading to neither man getting an advantage from this spot. Six then decides it's time to cheat. He grabs the cruiserweight title and this leads to Eddie Guerrero coming out and a tug of war takes place. Guerrero tries to take the belt away but this backfires and Dean gets clocked. The referee didn't see it and so Six pins Malenko and Six becomes the new cruiserweight champion. Eddie Guerrero just cost Dean Malenko the cruiserweight championship. A good opener here with a good amount of heat. 
DDP has a match tonight against a member of the NWO but he doesn't know who it's gonna be. Seeing as Hogan is in the main event, the outsiders are defending the tag titles, Six doesn't have it in him to wrestle another match, Big Bubba quote fell down a manhole on Nitro, so the question is who's it gonna be? Mean Gene Okerlund then gets word that Diamond Dallas Page will face Buff Bagwell tonight on the pay per view. DDP says just when Buff thinks he has his number, Diamond Cutter. We have a trios match next, La Parca, Conan and Viano 4 taking on Juventud Guerrera, Super Colo and Ciclope. Mike Tanay gives us an interesting fact as the match begins, Super Brawl 7 is actually the first ever pay per view held in the Cow Palace. You know what to expect from these trios matchups, fast high flying wrestling that the WWF at the time simply couldn't offer. Rather than go through the match move for move, have a look here at some of the more exciting moments of the matchup. Conan with an awesome rolling clothesline, Super Colo's sent on to the outside, La Parca's dive to a seated Colo, all good stuff. There were some dodgy moments too though, such as this one right here where Ciclope missed a springboard moonsault and he hit the floor hard. Something about this bump in his one eye makes this funny when it really shouldn't be. Hoovy pulled off a 450 and he landed right on Viano 4's head, La Parca pulled off a nice corkscrew that nailed Guerrera, and check out Guerrera's Hurricane Rana that followed. There was this spot here where every competitor got involved in a 6 man inverted cradle, and gonna be honest, I didn't think it looked all that great but what did look great was a doomsday device pulled off by Conan and Viano 4. Check this out too, La Parca pulling off a surfboard while 4 other competitors formed a star on the mat. I thought this was better than the big 6 man cradle. Conan ends up scoring the win with a sit down crucifix powerbomb, a fun match and one you shouldn't skip over if you enjoy cruiserweight action. Prince Ikea got a big upset win on Monday Nitro when he pinned Steve Regal for the TV title. Regal was overly confident, he allowed himself to get distracted by Mysterio and the Prince scored a big win on Monday night. This Super Brawl match was originally supposed to be Regal vs Mysterio and I read a report stating that Prince Ayake was given the TV title as a way to counter Rocky Maivia winning the IC title. Not sure if that's true but seeing as Jacqueline's arrival also matches up with China's debut, a woman who WCW were eager to sign, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Still, I would have preferred Regal in this match and I'm sure many others would also. Mysterio rolls out of a wrist lock to start this one off, we see a waist lock, a hammer lock, a side head lock, and we also see a bit of a timing issue here after a shoulder tackle and drop kick from Mysterio. Ikea goes for a springboard attack and even though Mysterio dodges it, he still takes a standing side kick. You can tell that Prince Ikea lacks confidence here. He seems to ever so slightly delay in everything he does and it's very noticeable particularly after watching the trios match. Funnily enough, even Dusty Rhodes makes mention of Prince's confidence as the match goes to the outside. The Prince pulls off a shaky looking crossbody from the top rope here. Back inside the ropes, Mysterio takes a vertical suplex followed by a backbreaker and the crowd is totally silent. Ikea tries to get the audience into it a little but this is rapidly going downhill and it's because people just don't care for Prince Ikea. As soon as Ray comes back by drop kicking his opponent out of an aerial attack, the crowd begins to make noise. Mysterio pulls off a hurricane rana that sends Ikea to the outside, Mysterio then lands a middle rope sent on dive and this looked great thanks to the camera angle. It looked like Prince Ikea got crushed here. Back inside the ring you can see Mysterio get frustrated, he pulls off a beautiful springboard moonsault and for whatever reason Prince Ikea kicks out at 1. The Prince then goes for snake eyes but Ray counters it, Mysterio pulls off an Arabian press moonsault or a rope flip moonsault but it only scores 2, at least it wasn't 1. And Prince Ikea eventually comes back with a super Samoan drop that admittedly looked pretty good. Steve Regal then shows up, I think Regal didn't make it to the ring on time to stop Mysterio's top rope attack and well we end up with this. Mysterio goes back to the outside to try again and this time Regal pulls Ray down and Mysterio gets his head slammed on the apron. Regal then throws Ray back into the ring and Prince Ikea covers the challenger. 1, 2, 3, Ikea retains the TV title. The prince realises what just happened and he doesn't want to take a cheap victory, at this point mate I think you should take whatever you can get. 
Even worse is the fact that he tries to give Mysterio the championship afterwards, making both Prince Ikea and Rey Mysterio look like losers and completely nullifying the match both men just took part in. A pretty poor bout here, you can and probably should skip over this one. The Giant gets interviewed next and it looks like he only applied oil to his left arm, <laughs> why? The big question tonight though is whether Lex Luger is gonna compete and team up with the big man. Luger was injured by Hall and Nash and Bischoff said that unless Lex could provide a doctor's note, then he wouldn't be able to compete in the scheduled Giant Luger vs Outsiders match. Luger provided the note one week too late though, and from the promo that the Giant cuts here, it sounds like we're gonna have a handicap match tonight. Giant says Hall and Nash are all about mind games and the Giant knows this because the big man was once part of the New World Order. The Outsiders want the Giant to get all fired up so he makes mistakes, but the Giant is composed tonight and he promises to leave Super Brawl with both tag team title belts. Diamond Dolls Page vs Buff Bagwell is our next matchup and Page gets a great ovation during the entrances. DDP's journey up the ranks in WCW as of late has been one of the most entertaining things to watch unfold on WCW programming. As for Bagwell, I've said this before, I don't hate the guy half as much as others do, and his transformation from American Male to Buff This Stuff was a good and much needed move. DDP baits Buff in with a slap to the face and we go through a wrist lock routine. Buff makes it to the ropes and DDP mocks Bagwell by rubbing his head. Bagwell grabs a handful of hair and Page gets slammed to the mat. Bagwell runs to the corner afterwards and the referee stops Page from attacking his opponent. Bagwell is now getting under Dallas' skin. A side headlock and a top wrist lock counter doesn't get Dallas very far, but a shoulder block followed by a swinging neckbreaker does. The crowd goes nuts here and Dallas is looking very good. Buff slides to the outside and Page ends up getting his neck snapped across the top rope. Bagwell mocks Dallas afterwards and he talks to the camera while choking Page inside the ring. Talking to the cameras would become Bagwell's favourite thing to do as time went on. DDP tries to push Bagwell away during a top rope DDT but it doesn't work. The push almost makes Bagwell's move look like a tornado diamond cutter, Page should be taking notes here. Buff poses to the camera and he says he's the stuff, and then he tells fans at home he'll be right back before laying in a few kicks. Page tries to catch Bagwell out with a few pins but he's unsuccessful, and Buff then gets annoyed at Scott Dickinson. Scott gets pushed, the referee pushes Buff down on his ass, and the crowd pops as Scott gives Buff an earful in the corner. Bagwell plays up to it brilliantly. Page comes back with a hard clothesline and Buff ends up taking a high angle inverted atomic drop. DDP then gets the crowd all fired up before hitting a sit down powerbomb, but Bagwell manages to kick out. Bagwell then tries to steal a victory by using the ropes for extra leverage during a pin attempt. DDP fires back with a pin attempt of his own, but he too is unsuccessful. And then Buff performs a fisherman suplex and he doesn't want to win via pinfall. He wants the referee to give Page a 10 count. Bagwell poses as the ref begins his count. Page makes it to his feet and Buff ends up going for a neck breaker but Page reverses and we see the diamond cutter. The NWO then hit the ring and Page gets out of harm's way. The referee throws the match out and Dallas escapes through the audience. While this match served well in making DDP more likeable to fans of WCW, the bout itself was just okay. Page's popularity though right now is off the charts and his upcoming rivalry on WCW programming would turn out to be the PWI feud of the year. Lionheart Chris Jericho vs Eddie Guerrero is up next and Eddie's US title is on the line. You expect big things from these two. Guerrero cost Malenko the cruiserweight title earlier on, but that doesn't play a part in this matchup at all. It starts off with your usual mix of lockups and holes and neither man gets the upper hand. The match resets and the speed picks up with Guerrero hitting a jumping back elbow and a side suplex. Jericho replies with a suplex of his own. A test of strength ends with Guerrero performing a bridge, but Jericho hits a northern light suplex when Eddie gets back up. Guerrero again bridges in order to kick out but Jericho performs a backslide afterwards. Eddie again kicks out at 2. Eddie and Chris then come to a stalemate after a few takedowns and a head scissors attempt. The two take their time and they recompose themselves. Jericho ends up locking in the lion tamer but he doesn't sit down low enough. 
The commentators mention that the finisher isn't locked in all the way. Eddie uses his legs to twist out of the move and then Chris brings it down to the mat, pulling Eddie's head back while pushing his knee into Guerrero's back. Chris keeps the pressure on the back by dropping Eddie across his shoulders but Eddie is still kicking out. Guerrero gets an opening when Chris misses a top rope crossbody and Eddie takes advantage by hitting a clothesline followed by a pinning powerbomb. Eddie then goes upstairs but he rolls out of his aerial attack. Chris fires back with a released German suplex and really this match could go either way, this hasn't been too bad. Jericho gets to his feet first but Guerrero shows great balance when countering a monkey flip. Eddie can't escape from an overhead belly to belly suplex though, but he does get a foot on the ropes to break the cover afterwards. So far, so good. Guerrero gets set up on the top rope and Jericho utilizes the middle rope to perform a drop kick. He then uses the second rope again for a dive to the outside and while Jericho connects, he also begins favoring the left knee. Undeterred, Jericho tries an aerial attack back inside the ring but he gets caught out with an inverted atomic drop. He tries a spinning wheel kick but Guerrero has the same idea and both men hit the mat. Jericho again reaches for his left knee. The two knock each other down again and this is where they begin to lose the audience. A few pin attempts follow but the crowd are silent. Jericho counters a tornado DDT attempt with a pinning northern light suplex, a great looking move by the way but the crowd boos when Eddie gets his foot on the ropes. It almost feels like the crowd wants the match to end so they can move on to the next. Everything Jericho and Eddie does inside the ring is good, but the problem here is the match really lacks heat. It even lacks heat going into the bout. The match comes to an end when Eddie performs a crucifix to sunset flip pin. Eddie retains the championship and yeah, they definitely lost this one as the match progressed. In a show of respect, Eddie places the US title on Jericho's shoulder. Chris hands it back, Eddie leaves the ring and Chris is left wondering where it all went wrong. I still enjoyed this match by the way but the fans in attendance grew tired of it towards the end. The Steiner brothers were supposed to compete in our next match but because of an automobile accident caused by Hall, Nash and Six, Rick and Scott miss out on an opportunity to become the number one contenders for the tag titles. We have the Faces of Fear vs Harlem Heat vs Public Enemy. Rocco Rock has a new look tonight and he starts this match off by getting his ass kicked by both the Faces of Fear and Harlem Heat. Johnny Grunge doesn't fare any better either, Booker T and Stevie Ray take turns in beating Grunge up and there's some hard hitting shots here. As a matter of fact, Johnny Grunge ends up in this match longer than anyone else and he takes a beating throughout his whole time in the ring. We eventually get Ming and Booker T inside the ropes and Ming pulls off a drop kick that only scores a two count. The faces of fear make Booker pay for kicking out and the barbarian hits a stunning top rope belly to belly suplex that makes the crowd go nuts. It's insane how much the audience is into this one in comparison to Guerrero vs Jericho. Booker's punishment continues with a pile driver from Ming and the faces of fear land double headbutts. We also see the faces of fear backdrop into a power bomb and Stevie Ray has to come in to save his brother. Johnny Grunge then tags in but the public enemies stay on the apron and they allow the other two teams to keep fighting and when it was time to strike, Rocco Rock goes to the top rope and he tries a senton. The barbarian catches him but Grunge then comes off the top rope and barbarian falls down hard. Grunge then gets the referee's attention as Rocco Rock pins the barbarian and this is how the public enemy won the match. Keep in mind that Rock was not the legal man by the way, Grunge was, but these things really don't matter in the world of WCW tag team wrestling. The public enemy are the number one contenders for the tag titles and this match was pretty average. Deborah McMichael has this weird infatuation with Jeff Jarrett and Big Mongo hasn't been too happy with his misses. Double J wants to be a horseman, Mongo, Benoit and Arn Anderson don't want anything to do with him. Ric Flair on the other hand also seems to like Double J. So if Double J can beat Steve McMichael tonight at Super Brawl, he'll become an official member of the Four Horsemen and he can conduct horseman business till his heart's content. This is a little personal though for Mongo seeing as his wife seems to really, really like Jarrett. Our match starts off then with a bit of a shaky transition from a side headlock to a hammerlock. Jarrett then gets the better of Mongo with a hip toss and Double J gives us a strut afterwards. Steve goes down with an arm drag and Jarrett makes fun of his opponent afterwards by laying across the top rope and Mongo makes Jarrett pay afterwards with a big power slam. 
When Mongo begins targeting the leg, Double J decides to roll out of the ring. Deborah decides to stop her husband from attacking Jeff on the outside, and this lets Jared get in a cheap shot. Deborah explains afterwards that they both need to keep this in the ring, but we all know what she's up to. Jared then tries to cheat while applying an abdominal stretch, but Deborah puts an end to it by hitting Jared's hand with the magical briefcase. So, does Deborah really want a fair fight here? I'm confused. Mongo misses a leg drop, but he gets right back up and he hits a press slam. Jarrett then gets clotheslined over the top rope, and Deborah decides to wipe Jeff down with a towel. Mongo takes the towel away, and he uses it to choke Jarrett and ram Jarrett into the guardrail. The match gets back inside the ropes, and Jarrett takes control, acting like the stuff on the outside never happened. Mongo takes a clothesline and he, <laughs> he falls forward for some reason. Classic Mongo. The two men then trade sleeper holds, and after Jarrett hits a back suplex, Deborah says she doesn't know which competitor she should help. Tony Schiavone rightfully says that she should help neither man. Mongo lands a sidewalk slam, Jarrett replies with a flying crossbody, and when Steve kicks out, the referee takes a bump, allowing Deborah to get involved in the match. Steve tells Deborah to hand over the briefcase. Deborah refuses. She then throws the briefcase into the ring where Jared picks it up. Mongo gets nailed and the match is over. Jared wins via pinfall, and Jared has just become a member of the Four Horsemen. Or is that the Five Horsemen now? Deborah gives the cameras a little wink before she checks on her husband inside the ropes. It looks like Steve is waking up here from a bad dream. This match was the worst on the card, taking the title away from Mysterio and Prince Ikea. The San Francisco Street fights up next, now billed as a San Francisco death match. Kevin Sullivan with Jackie vs Chris Benoit with Woman. You know the story here, Benoit and Woman became an item, effectively meaning Nancy had left Kevin Sullivan for Chris. Jacqueline then showed up as a mystery part of Kevin Sullivan's past, the two are now a couple, but all we know about Jackie is that she sympathises with Sullivan and also, she knows how to wrestle. The moment Jackie and Woman get strapped together, they begin fighting. Sullivan and Benoit go at it too and the cow palace erupts. They seem pretty pumped up for this one. Woman and Jackie whip each other on the outside while Sullivan hits a backdrop on Benoit. Jackie stops Woman from jumping into the ring and Woman returns the favour when Jacqueline tries to knock Chris off the top rope. There's quite a bit going on here and the commentary team have trouble keeping up with the action. Woman and Jackie end up in the ring and they're stealing the show here. As soon as they get physical, the crowd cheers. Sullivan then tries to intervene but he gets his little taskmaster smashed with the strap. Chris then tries to stop Jackie from attacking Nancy but he gets whipped across the back for his troubles. Woman loses the strap and this allows Sullivan to take advantage while Jackie kicks Benoit's little rabid wolverine. This makes Dusty completely lose his mind. Yes, she yeah. kicked him! Yes she did! She kicked him in the thing! I can't see it! Woman beats the hell out of Sullivan while Benoit has his hands full with Jacqueline on the outside. The women then use the strap to take out the men before they begin fighting again. Sullivan and Benoit just take this all in before they too go back to beating the hell out of each other. Benoit and Sullivan then begin fighting on the entranceway and they make it all the way back to the parking and loading area. They have a short fight here where neither man gets the upper hand. I'm surprised they didn't go to the restrooms. And while all this was going on, the fans in attendance got to watch Jackie and Woman go at it inside the ring. It doesn't take long for Sullivan and Benoit to make their way back though, and Chris ends up taking a running knee while in the tree of woe position. Sullivan hits his little bunny hop, it should have all been over right now, but Woman breaks up the pin. Sullivan goes after Woman, and this allows Chris to wake up and perform a pile driver. Benoit then brings a table into the ring, he sets Sullivan up and he goes for a splash, but Jackie jumps on top of Kevin, trying to offer some protection. Benoit still performs the splash, and the table doesn't break. This must have hurt. I am the table. This is how the match ends. Benoit pins Jackie and Sullivan, and Chris Benoit wins the match. Afterwards, Sullivan Woman and Benoit lay on the mat motionless. Sullivan and Jackie seem to be in real bad shape, and Chris isn't doing too well either. Officials Lee Marshall, Paul Orndorff and Terry Taylor come out to check on the damage, and the doctors are also called to take Sullivan, Benoit and Jackie away from the ring. They're trying to make this look pretty serious, the three competitors get stretchered out and we see them getting loaded into ambulances outside. It ends with Jackie, Benoit and Sullivan taking a trip to the local hospital. 
Fun march though, I can see why maybe some people wouldn't like it because it's quite chaotic, but I enjoyed it. Hopefully though, this is the end of the Benoit and Sullivan rivalry, they really need to move on to something else. The Outsiders defend the tag team titles next in a handicap match. We already talked earlier about why the Giants partner, Lex Luger, isn't allowed to compete in the bout. Six comes out with the Outsiders and Hall and Nash just look like absolute superstars here. They carry themselves like they're above everyone else and it does give them a cool factor that I feel many others lack in WCW. The Giant comes out all alone and the Outsiders mock the big man. A fan in attendance think Hall and Nash are crossdressers and I've no idea what gave him or her that idea, it's a bit weird. An incredible amount of time is wasted here to begin with, the Outsiders play rock paper scissors and Nash does the job, meaning Hall will start this one off. Hall throws his toothpick at the Giant and when Giant tries to attack Hall, the bad guy slaps his opponent around a little. This is that battle plan the Giant talked about earlier, the Outsiders are trying to make the big man mad. Hall finally tries to wrestle but he takes a back elbow that sends him to the mat. Hall then falls down when the giant grabs his face, I think Hall's bump might have been a little premature here. Scott tries to recompose himself and he goes on to hit some ridiculously hard chops in the corner. The giant tries to give as good as he gets before he slams Hall back into the outsiders corner, the giant wants Big Nash. Scott Hall decides to spit on the giant before tagging in Big Sexy, again trying to make the big man mad and it looks like it worked for a moment. Nash and Giant build up a little anticipation before going to work and the fans are very much into the match. Nash gets the upper hand to begin with but the Giant retaliates and the crowd lose their minds. Giant then takes care of Hall before hitting Nash with a dropkick, Big Sexy falls out of the ring and the Giant follows up by ramming Nash's back into the ring post. Back inside the ring, Scott Hall distracts Mark Curtis allowing Six to hit Giant with the cruiserweight belt. Nash lands a big boot immediately afterwards and then Scott Hall slips when trying to perform a second rope bulldog. Still, Nash covers Giant afterwards but the Giant kicks out at 2. A loud Luger chant breaks out as Nash chokes Giant in the corner. The numbers game catches up to Giant as Hall takes every opportunity to attack the big man from the apron. Six, on the other hand, completely misses a kick and credit to the commentary team, they call it out. Hall climbs the turnbuckles and he tries to lay in a few punches but the giant keeps pushing him away. Nash then comes in and look at Nash lowering his head for a big boot and then blatantly calling for a clothesline afterwards, it's as clear as day. Giant catches Six in midair and he throws him onto Nash, Hall then hits Giant with the cruiserweight belt and then… This. That looks so so impressive. Lex Luger then makes his way down to the ring and he tosses Eric Bischoff to the side. Luger wants in this match and he wants tagged in right away. Lex gets the tag, he cleans house, Nash finds himself in the torture rack and we have new tag team champions. I want you to watch that again but keep focus on referee Mark Curtis this time. What a phenomenal referee. The Giant gives Scott Hall a chokeslam before the celebrations begin. There were a few rough moments during the match but you can't help but get excited towards the end. The powerbomb was insane, that could have been the end of the match, but the cow palace becomes completely unglued when Luger makes his way down to the ring and well, the rest is history. It's insane to think that Bischoff at one point didn't want to sign Lex Luger and Luger also took a low ball offer to begin work in world championship wrestling. The guy is super over here. And so Roddy Piper has arrived at the arena from Alcatraz and it's time for our main event of the evening. I've enjoyed this show so far by the way, there hasn't been a match that's topped the WWF's final 4 main event, but I definitely recommend Super Brawl 7 as a complete pay per view over the WWF's February show. Hollywood Hogan comes out first and he's brought DiBiase and Vincent along for the ride. Piper comes out looking like a complete mess because, you know, Alcatraz. And man, if you thought Nash and Hall were good at wasting time, you ain't seen nothing yet. Hogan spits on Piper's kilt, he tries to build up enough courage to step into the ring, but he just decides to leave instead. The referee holds Piper back as Hogan walks up the rampway and then he turns around and he walks back. Hogan goes to leave again but this time Piper jumps him from behind and the two men finally get physical. This is the abridged version by the way, no point talking about Hogan walking around the outside of the ring. 
Piper throws Hogan inside the ropes and the hot rod goes straight for the eyes. The Hulkster then takes a blatant low blow, a low blow that the referee allows, and then Piper chokes Hogan with his shirt before sinking his teeth into Hulk's forehead. The crowd loves it, a lot of people can't sit down. Piper continues to choke Hulk at the ring apron and on the entranceway. Hogan made this one personal when he said Roddy Piper hid behind his own son and Piper's making Hulk pay right now for those comments. You kinda get took out of the moment when Piper hits an extremely soft chair shot on Hulk. He was so unhinged the moment before, but yeah, not great at all. The two men get in the ring and Hogan hits a low blow. Piper sells it for a few seconds before going straight back on the attack. So that's what Piper was doing in Alcatraz, drawing a massive pair of indestructible balls. Piper begins biting Hogan's nose and this is enough to make Michael Wall Street hit the ring, god love him. Piper takes care of Wall Street and Vincent, Hogan takes control for a few moments but a classic poke to the eye sends Hulk right back down. Hulk begs for mercy and… <laughs> okay. Another fight on the outside takes place and Piper again pokes Hulk in the eye to keep momentum. They get back inside the ring where the punishment continues and then… Sting and the Macho Man show up and they stand at the entranceway. Savage stops Sting from entering the ring on Nitro and this time it's Sting who tries to stop Savage. Savage waits until Sting's back's turned and then he makes a beeline for it. Savage stands at ringside while Sting waits at the entranceway. Something's gonna happen here but the fans make it crystal clear that they want Sting. Hogan has turned the match around and Piper's now taking a beating. Sting then decides to leave the arena and Piper notices that Savage is at ringside. Hogan delivers more punishment at the ring post before the two competitors get back inside the ring. They fight on their knees for a moment before Hogan locks in a bear hug. Savage looks on as the commentators remind us that Bischoff has stopped Macho from competing inside the ring. The last time Savage competed on TV, it was back at Halloween Havoc. The bear hug gets brought down to the mat and Hogan chokes Piper. Roddy fights back but another low blow gets delivered. Again, Piper has balls of steel tonight so he shrugs it off and Hogan finds himself locked in the sleeper. This is what defeated Hulk back at Starcade and Piper does it again. Hogan can't raise his arm on the third try and Roddy Piper wins the match and Roddy Piper becomes WCW champion. While Roddy began celebrating, Savage pulled Hulk's feet beneath the ropes. The referee notices where Hogan's feet are and so the match continues, it hasn't ended yet. Curtis allows the main event to go on. Savage then passes Hogan a pair of brass knucks that don't look like brass knucks but we'll just call them brass knucks anyway. And then Piper gets clocked. Hulk Hogan covers Roddy Piper for the 1, 2, 3 and Hulk Hogan has just retained the WCW Championship and Randy Savage has become part of the New World Order. Savage gives the Hulkster a big old hug before nailing Piper. Roddy gets NWO spread on his chest. The Hot Rod then takes a beating from Savage and Hogan as Super Brawl draws to a close. Two leg drops from Hogan, three diving elbows from Savage. Piper gets completely annihilated here. So much for staying in Alcatraz for seven days. Hogan and Savage go to the camera and they dedicate this match to Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. And that's how Super Brawl ended. The question now is where does Sting fit into all this? Super Brawl 7 is a good pay per view in my opinion, not brilliant but definitely worth putting on. There are a few matches you can skip, the Prince I care about, the Jeff Jarrett match, even the triple threat tag match could get passed over and you wouldn't miss all that much. The main event wasn't good either in my opinion. I thought the Starcade Hogan vs Piper match was a little better but it's worth sitting through to see Macho Man join the dark side. The Sullivan vs Benoit match was fun. Luger's pop and Nash powerbombing the giant makes the tag match worth a watch. And then the other matches on the card ranged from decent to good. As mentioned, it's a better overall show than In Your House 13 but the final four match is definitely the best pay per view match of the month. I hope you enjoyed looking back at Super Brawl 7 with me today and I hope to see you next week also for Reliving the War episode 72. We're going to check out the Super Brawl Fallout show there so hopefully a lot of questions get answered. Thanks for watching guys and take care.